Acts chapter 9, uh, probably one of the better known chapters in, in Acts and yet one that still amazes us as we go through. Uh, it says in Saul, yet breathing out threatenings. Remember, he's been hailing men uh, and women and kids and uh, separating families and causing uh, damage to come to families, uh, just bringing out the, the Christians uh, to that place of being chastised and, and disciplined, even killed in some ways. Uh, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and, and slaughter against the enemy, uh, against the enemy, against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, <laughs> uh, the way of, of walking with Christ, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem, the, the hardened heart, the seared heart, the, the heart that was just given over to the ways of the enemy, just to do that to people, uh, bring them back to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him, a light from heaven, uh, this light that was brighter than the noonday sun, brighter than the light that he had been in as he traveled, this light that would just uh, uh, blind him almost to the sense of uh, just uh, not being able to see and move. Uh, it tells us this in Second Corinthians 4, uh, uh, verse 6, uh, it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And Paul, Saul here, certainly in darkness, uh, needed to see that light, needed to know what that light was, needed to understand that there's a difference between religion and relationship, needed to know that, that he was in the presence of the Holy One of Israel, uh, not as he had made him out to be, but for who he was. And isn't that the cry of our hearts sometimes, that people would know him for who he is instead of what they want him to be or what they make him out to be. Uh, and so much of religion has come to that place that, that we make God out to be what we want him to be uh, instead of what the Word says. Uh, we We can't do justice by putting on him uh, the onus of, of what our expectations are, what we think God should be like. Uh, in, in so many places, you, you hear it even with the shootings that were going on. Well, if God was real, why didn't he stop that girl from shooting? Uh, <laughs> he's not going to interfere in that way. He, he wants to interrupt our lives, but but not to cause things to stop, but but. Uh, in necessity to cause people to come to a, a realization of their need for him. We, we've discarded God. We, we've pushed him aside. We've gotten rid of the Ten Commandments. We've pushed prayer out of schools. We've pushed the Lord out, out of any kind of, of service. And uh, when they mention him, uh, almost laughed at and, and mocked. Uh, so what do we really expect? And, and really the condition of this gal is really the condition of the country, where the country has gone to. Uh, the country has gone to a place of, of thinking evil is good and, and good is evil, uh, of thinking that they have the right to take somebody's life and uh, to take the place of God, to take someone's life, when in realization we have no right like that whatsoever. But that's the condition of the country. We've got put God so far away from the country that this is where the country is. And it's not God's fault. It's man's fault for taking the place of God or thinking that we can take the place of God. And Saul, in that place of just wanting these Christians to uh, be, be harmed so that this, this relationship that they have with the Lord would just be done away with, that this Christian faith would, would no longer be around, that the name of Jesus would be put down. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that nothing can hold that name down? For there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. And aren't you glad you can say that name without swearing? <laughs> what a change that is for us. 
uh, that, that we can say that name and say it with love, say it knowing how precious that name is, knowing how precious that that name is to us, to our lives, to our kids, to our families, uh, to our church body, to, to the community, how precious that name is. We get to know it. The, the world doesn't see it as precious. Uh, they're using it in a whole different way, but uh, we get to see it for the, the precious way that it is. Uh, and it should become more and more precious to us, that realization of what he's done for us, that he died and rose again. We're in that season where, uh, you know, the Easter bunnies are flying around and everything else is going on. Uh, but, but we see the resurrection take place. And the resurrection that means that God accepted Christ's payment on the cross for you and I so that we could have forgiveness of sin and have a hope of heaven. There is no hope of heaven outside of Jesus Christ and a relationship with him. Uh, and Saul comes to this place. He, he, he isn't satisfied with, with just pushing things down in Jerusalem. He's going to Damascus to get people. Uh, when we're driven by anger, when we're driven by a false sense of who we are and a false sense of, of what we have, it drives us to places that, that are beyond uh, where we even are. It pushes us and it pushes us out. And Saul pushed out, uh, coming to this place, uh, and suddenly the light shined round about him. <laughs> Just an amazing thing to me. And, and we think, Lord, I'm not important enough for you to come to and to minister to me. I'm too bad. But here's a man that was probably worse than uh, at least putting into practice those things that we think in our minds sometimes. Uh, but, but, but a man that was so bad uh, that, that the whole church was afraid of him, that he was killing people in the name of the Lord in such an awful thing and yet the light shined around him it says it doesn't say the whole group that was with him it just says him and we think well lord i'm not worth your light shining in and yet he if he did it for paul don't you think he would do it for you and me and he did didn't he because there was one day he shined his light on you and i and said hey how you doing <laughs> we go awful <laughs> he says i've got a plan for you and I've got salvation for you. And so he comes to Paul. And you just wonder, what was the prayer life of the people in Damascus? Because they knew he was coming. <laughs> wonder what they were praying. We'll find out when we get to heaven. When we find those people that were in Damascus. We'll see. But there's a light that shined round about him. Um, a, a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. He repeats his name twice for emphasis, just so that Saul would know he was talking directly to him. He hears a voice, why do you persecute me? <laughs> He's not after the people. He's persecuting the Lord. And the actions that were against God's people are really against God. And so we certainly need to be careful in our own hearts and our own thoughts and our own minds uh, about the things that we're saying about others who are Christians because we're persecuting the Lord in the midst of it. And, you know, sometimes we just get so upset with people, you know, I'd just love to drop kick you right now. And, and, and the Lord goes, me? <laughs> uh, no, not you, Lord, not you, just, just one of your people. Well, if you're doing it to them, you're doing it to me. Oh, and that should really put a stay on our hearts, put a stop to our hearts of those thoughts and those that anger, that, that frustration with people that would cause us to lash out at them when we're really we're lashing out at the Lord for what he's doing through them to us. But here he is in the sight of, of a glorified Savior, and he says two wonderful things. The first thing he says, who are you, Lord? The first thing he says. And the second thing he, he, he says is, Lord, what would you have me to do? And we can't turn those around. You have to know who the risen Savior is first before you can ask him what you want him, what you 
uh, have what he has for you to do. You, you can't turn those around. So he falls to the earth. He hears a voice crying out to him. And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Can you imagine? <laughs> The one that you're persecuting, the one that you're coming after, the one that you're, you're, you're causing all this damage to is me. He says, is it hard for you to kick against the pricks, the goads, the things that, that are causing uh, these things to just prick your heart to come to so much anger? Isn't it hard for you to kick against these things? <laughs> and it is, isn't it? Sin is hard. It, it caught, when we kick against the things of the Lord, it becomes a real hard walk with the Lord and against the Lord. Um, and he says the, these things and those goads were used for the cattle, the, the, the farmers and, and those that would drive the cattle would, would use these things and, and they would keep these things on the wagon so that they wouldn't kick and so that they wouldn't go a wrong direction. They wouldn't turn when they weren't supposed to, and if they did, it would cause the, the these thorns, these things that were uh, tied near them. Uh, as they would go the wrong direction, it would cause them to be pricked with these things so that they would go back in the right direction. And, and he was trembling, and he was astonished. <laughs> and he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Such a wonderful thing, such an easy salvation. And the world says it's too easy. Don't you have to work for it? No, we have to believe. This is the work that I have for you. He tells us in the Gospel of John to believe on him who sent me. That we believe on him. This is the work that we have for him. And he said, Lord, what would you have me to do personally? What would you have me to do in that way that would now that, that I know who you are, that you're real, that you're true? Because Jesus is crucified, right? And so he's talking to this person that he can't even see. And Paul, who had to have everything visual for him, because remember, he had a, re, a, a relationship in a church body, in a system that was all visual. These are the commandments. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. It was all visual. And here he is talking to someone he can't see, <laughs> completely against his, his belief system completely against what he thought God was like. And he wasn't in anger at him. I don't think these words are words of anger. I think these words are words of love to draw his heart. It's his goodness, it's his kindness that draws us to repentance. It's not his yelling and screaming at us. You know, it's like us with our kids, you know, when we're so upset with them and we look at them and go, do you want a spanking? Actually, no. <laughs> Why would we want that? Our, our yelling and screaming doesn't do anything for them, but, but to just cause them to dr be driven away. It, it's the kindness. It's the love that draws them. And it's the love of Jesus that draws us to him. Why are you pers persecuting me? Well, Lord, what do you want me to do then? Now that I know who you are, that you're real, that, that I know that you're risen again, that I know that you're off the cross and you're out of the tomb and you're in heaven just like Peter or just like Stephen. Remember, he's the one that was holding the coats, holding the garments when they stoned Stephen. He was consenting to it, it says. He voted for it. And yet here's the one where he's persecuting, coming to him in such a gracious way and asking him, Saul, why are you against me? And sometimes I think the Lord needs to come to us in, in the church. Why are you against me? Because if we're against those in the church, if we're against those that the Lord has put in into our path at work or in our neighborhoods and, and we're lashing out, he comes and he says to us, why are you persecuting me and coming against these people? And so we need to say, Lord, who are you? I don't know you like this. I need to know you better. And then what do you want me to do about it? How do you want me to change? How do you want my heart to be different? And we can get as upset as, as the world as we want to. We can get as upset at the government as we want to. And it's not really going to do us any good. It's just, Lord, who are you in the midst of this? And what do you want me to do about it while I'm here? 
And we know one thing, he wants our heart to be right. <laughs> Lashing out at the government is not going to do us any good, but complying with, with his direction for our lives is going to do so much more. It's going to change our hearts. And we think, well, I want their hearts to be changed. And the Lord goes, well, first let's change yours and then we'll work on theirs. <laughs> because our hearts are the ones that he's working on and ministering to at the moment. So, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? And how do I change in the midst of this? And, and we see four things here. Uh, and you may want to circle them as you go through. But, but four things, four marks that happen to a believer. In, in verses 4 to 6, uh, we have to meet and hear the things of the Lord. And that's the first thing that has to happen to a believer. We have to meet the risen Lord and we have to hear him speak to our hearts. Maybe not audibly like like Saul is, but certainly through his word, because this is a living word. So in, through verses four through six, then we, we meet and hear uh, our Savior. Then the second thing in, in verse six is uh, we want to do his will. And this is a mark of a believer. And so many in the church just want Jesus as Savior, but they don't want to do what he has for us. They don't want him to be Lord over their life. And doing his will is certainly a mark of a true believer, one who's given himself over to the things of the Lord, one who wants the things of the Lord more than they want their own will to be done. And that's a change of a heart that only God can do in and through us. But it's a mark of a believer. The third thing then is down in verse 11. Uh, and, and it says there that the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to the street that's called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one who called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, <clears throat> excuse me, he prayeth. He's praying. A different kind of a prayer than he's probably ever prayed in his life. But the third mark of a believer is that we're going to be praying. We're a praying people. Not praying for our will to be done, but praying for God's will to be done. And then the fourth thing uh, uh, is that uh, we will be baptized if possible. <laughs> in verse 18, uh, as you look down, it says, Immediately there fell from his eyes that it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized, baptized into the faith. And sometimes that baptism is a Holy Spirit baptism. Sometimes that baptism is being immersed in water. Uh, but if, if at all possible, it's just the closest thing to a commandment that Jesus said was that we could be baptized, that we would be baptized, at least baptized into the faith. Um, and so we see these things and we see these things going on. Uh, we see a couple more things that we're going to get to, but we won't get to them tonight probably. But here's these four marks that Paul is going to fall into right away and do. Who are you, Lord? And what would you have me to do? And the Lord said unto him in verse 6, Arise. First thing I want you to do, Saul, is get up. Mm, isn't it amazing? It's the first time Saul has fallen down before his Lord, before the true and the living God. And Scripture tells us that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And here he is. He's, he's on his face before him, humbled before him, this man who is so proud one of the most brilliant men to come through uh, the Jewish faith. A brilliant, brilliant man taught by, by one of the, the, the most renowned teachers in all of Rome at the time. And he's bowed before the Lord and the Lord tells him to arise. Doesn't say, I want you to stay there for a while and grovel in the dirt. <laughs> he never tells us to do that. Once we confess him to be Lord and Savior, he says, then arise and go in this faith. Arise and do the things that I have before you. Arise, go into the city, and it's going to be told you what you must do. I've got a plan for your life, Saul, just like he does for each and every one of us. We just don't always realize that, Lord, you have a plan for me. I'm nobody. I'm not a Saul. I'm not a Peter. I said, but you're one of the most important people in my kingdom because I have a plan for you. And if I have a plan for you, it's important. 
So arise, go into the city. And he, notice he doesn't tell them everything that's going to go on right away. He just says, get up and go into the city. And then I'll tell you step two once you get there. <laughs> it, it's amazing. We have to be obedient to the first thing before we can move on to the second thing. Well, Lord, if you don't tell me I'm not really going to do anything, then you'll never know my goodness and my grace. You'll never know my love. You'll never know the direction that I have for you. So the men that journeyed with him, verse 7, stood speechless. <laughs> That's a good thing. Hearing a voice, but seeing no man. They, they heard the, the sound of a voice, but, but they didn't see anybody. They didn't know what it was for. They didn't understand all that was going on. This was for Paul and Paul alone. Amazing. Because the faith that we get from the Lord is individual. You can't live off of somebody else's faith. The other men couldn't be saved because Saul got saved. They had to get saved on their own because the Lord would meet with them at whatever time he would meet with them. And so Saul arose from the earth being obedient, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. <laughs> but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. They bring him into the city. He's blind. And he was there three days without sight. Whenever you see the number three in Scripture, you know something big is going to happen. Three days, three nights in the belly of the whale. Three days, three nights in the center of the earth. You know something's going to happen. He was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. <laughs> uh, he was there just blown away by what had happened. And can you imagine the, the thoughts that the enemy would want to bring to his life? Because it's the same thoughts that we have. You know, you, hear, you see a scripture jump out at you, and you try and tell somebody uh, about it, and it kind of just falls flat on the floor because the word is for you. It isn't for somebody else. And they just kind of go, okay, that was a great verse. <laughs> and you just go, well, maybe I really didn't hear from the Lord then. Maybe it wasn't really him. It was probably just my imagination. And yet Paul sat before the Lord. And what did he do? We see down further. He, he was praying. Three days, three nights, fasting and praying to the Lord who he had just met. Ugh. Not worrying about the enemy just knowing that God was going to do something. God told him, I'm going to do something with you. He's believing it. And God has told each and every one of us he wants to do something in our lives. Uh, we just need to be listeners so that we can hear what God wants to do, even if it's just to change our hearts. Isn't that enough? Mm. If that's what God has for us, it should be enough. And it should make us content in our walk with him. He's there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. I don't know about you, but losing your sight is an awful thing as you see people going around. Uh, in my BC days, uh, I, I played softball for a number of teams uh, and not always in the best of shape. Uh, and one day we had a practice in which we were in awful shape, uh, and I found a softball in my eye. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, had to get a patch, had to do all that stuff. And that was one of the most awful times. Because, you, you, I mean, seeing with one eye is okay, but seeing with two is wonderful. Do you, do you realize what a gift we have that we can see? Oh, my goodness. And then to see spiritual things with, with our spiritual eyes is even a more wonderful thing. He was blind physically but he could see spiritually. Ah, oh, that is so sweet. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And you look and go, Ananias? <laughs> we just read about Ananias a few chapters before, didn't we? Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> so what is the Lord doing calling a man named Ananias? I think one of the things that he's doing, he's blessing Ananias. Another thing he's doing, he's redeeming the names of those that have failed. Because doesn't God do everything to redeem what has been broken down? One day we know Jesus is going to step back on planet Earth and he's going to put the world back together the way it should have been at the start. He's going to redeem fallen Earth. He's going to redeem everything that's been broken down by man and by the, the world. Ananias, 
And we don't read about this man ever again. He was there for one time, for one purpose, for one thing. Well, Lord, you mean that that might be all that you have for me in my life is just one thing? One shot at stardom? And he goes, what do you want stardom for? You're walking with me. You don't need stardom. (laughs) You need to be obedient. need to be obedient in the little things because I'm going to bring something big to your life. And if you're not ready for it, it may just go by without you ever seeing it. Here's Ananias being faithful in Damascus, teaching, ministering, and the Lord calls him. His name was Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And look at what he says. He says, Behold, I am here, Lord. Remember the story of Samuel when he's in the temple with Eli and he's a young boy? And how many times did the Lord have to call Samuel before Eli finally realized Samuel, I know you're a young man in the Lord and you don't know much about the faith, but the Lord's calling you. It took him three times before Eli finally realized it's the Lord. And he was the high priest. Shows the condition of the church then, doesn't it? (laughs) But as soon as Ananias heard his name being called, what did he do? I'm here, Lord. What do you want? Oh, that is an obedient heart that's ready for the Lord to call him so that he can respond to him. <clears throat> he may have never had anything else going on in his life, but all of a sudden the Lord calls and he said, I'm ready. I've been prepared for this minute. You've been preparing my heart. I'm ready. I'm here. He didn't have to call him three times. Oh, and I pray that's that's for us. That's for, for me, for you, that when the Lord calls, we're obedient and quick to be obedient and quick to hear, slow to speak, quick to hear right (laughs) and and so here he is he calls him and he says i'm here lord and the lord said to him arise i bet you he wasn't ready for what he was going to tell him to do though (laughs) arise go into the street that's called straight for one uh called saul of tarsus for behold he prayeth uh and it tells us uh this in, in matthew chapter 7 uh Verses 13 and 14, it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. And here he is in this street that's called straight. The Lord is so cool as he puts all these things together, just to encourage you and I that, yeah, it's it's a straight path. It's It may be a hard path. It may be a narrow path. But it's a path God has called us to. And we all know we could be out there doing the stuff that the world is doing. And we may be okay at it. But it's not the straight path. It's not the narrow path. And so you, just by choosing that narrow path, are in a place of blessing. Because there's not a place of blessing in the wide place, in the wide gate but only in the narrow. And so you're just putting yourself in that place to be blessed, to be ministered to by the Lord, and to be obedient to the Lord by being in that straight place. You could be out in the world, not going to church, not reading your Bibles, but that wide place has no place of blessing. The place of blessing is in the straight path. We need to stay in there no matter what the rest of the church does, no matter what the rest of the world does, or what the government says. We stay in this place because we walk with the king. (laughs) And so the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street that's called called straight, and inquire at the house of who? Judas. (laughs) He's dealing with an Ananias and a Judas. Hello? (laughs) I think the Lord is doing something with, with Saul, doing something with these guys, doing something with the disciples to realize God can save anybody and God can work through. For behold, he prayeth. He's in that place of praying. And he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias. He said, Ananias, I'm telling you, I've already told Saul you're coming. That puts a little pressure on you, doesn't it? (laughs) Because Ananias is not a happy camper about this. He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, not only do you have to go talk to him, you got to touch him. Oh, 
can, can I touch him with the right hand of fellowship, you know, like kind of like a right hook? No, you're going to put your hand on him gently, and you're going to pray for him, Ananias. Oh, really, Lord? I waited all my life for you to call me to ministry, and this is the ministry you're going to give me? You're going to have me go to a murderer and pray for him? Really? Lord, can I just go down to the Open Door Mission and serve for a couple of weeks? Will that, will that be okay? <laughs> no, you got to go to Straight Street and see Saul. Alone? <laughs> can I take a bodyguard? No, this is for you and for him. This is what I've called you both to. And I want you to put your hand on him that he, re he might receive his sight. You mean he's going to receive his sight while I'm still there so he can turn around, see my face, and know what I look like so he can come get me later? <laughs> uh, then Ananias answered, Lord, <laughs> just, just speaking to him, just, Lord, this is my heart. This is where I am. And, and notice the Lord's not upset with him, but the Lord is going to move him forward. Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he's done to your saints. The first mention of the New Testament church saints in Jerusalem. I, I, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he's done. This is an evil man, Lord. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call upon thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go your way. <laughs> He doesn't argue with him. He just says, this is my command for you that you go. Ananias, I've spoken to you in a vision. I've ministered to you. And, and so twice he tells him, this is what I want you to do. Oh, the Lord's not afraid. If we're upset at the, at the understanding of what God wants for us to ask him, he's not afraid to answer us the second time. But the Lord said unto him, Go your way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name, to carry my name, to put in front of him my name. And what happens when we carry something? People see it, right? They should see Jesus in us as we carry him, as we bear his name in our bodies, in our hearts, in our minds, on our lips. People should know that we're Christians. Mm. I'm going to bear your name, Lord. I'm going to bear your image. We're image bearers of who the Lord is. We're made in his image. We've seen it in Genesis. We're made in his image. We're image bearers. We carry his image. We carry his name to those that are around us, to those that, that are going to be with us and fall into our path. He's a chosen vessel unto me. He's one that, that I've chosen uh, from a long time ago, Ananias. And so I want you to go. I want you to minister to him. Can you imagine the fear, the trepidation that's in his heart? But also, what is he thinking about those that he tells? I went to see Saul. Really? Did you give him our names? Did you tell him where we live? <laughs> uh, he's a chosen vessel to me. He's going to bear my name where? Before the Gentiles, before kings, and before the children of Israel. I've got a lot ready for this guy. He's an industrious guy. I've got a lot ready for him. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Not in detail, but, but he is going to go through many countries, many places, many hurts. But he's going to do that for his name, not for his Saul's own name, but for God's name. He's going to bear his name. He's going to carry his name wherever he goes from then on. And you can't carry his name until his name is written in your heart, until he indwells you, until you're born again of his spirit. You can't do it just by belonging to a church. There's always that that comes out just because you're in a garage doesn't make you a car. <laughs> Just because you're at McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Just because you're in a church doesn't make you a Christian. It's a relationship that has to come through that knowing of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And so Ananias went his way 
It doesn't say he hesitated after that. It doesn't say he put it off for a few days. It says he went. Even though he was scared, even though he was fearful, even though he was questioning God's sanity at the moment, (laughs) it didn't stop him. And that is such a wonderful thing. God, if you said it, I want to do it. Oh, if only we as the church could do that, huh? Because how many mornings do you sit there reading his word and he says something to you out of his word? And you sit there and go, well, maybe tomorrow I'll think about it. Or maybe I'll look up the Greek and the Hebrew (laughs) instead of just going out and doing it. Be quick to obey the things that the Lord has for us as we bear his name. So Ananias went his way, entered into the house and put his hands on him. (laughs) It's amazing. In verse 12, it said he put his, I I want you to go uh, because I've shown Saul that you're coming and you're going to put your hand on him. And in this verse, in verse 17, he put both his hands on him to be obedient, not in fear, not to strangle him, but because he was a chosen vessel of the Lord. He put his hands on him and look at what he says, brother Saul. Instead of you dirty, sneaky, rotten person who killed Christians, who's you, you killed some of my relatives, you killed some of the people I know, you took them to jail, you split up families, you've hurt people, he calls them brother. I know you're forgiven by the Lord because I know the forgiveness of the Lord. And for you and I, that should be the same thing. If we've gotten the forgiveness of the Lord, then we should have forgiveness for others. For those that have hurt us, for those that have said things about us, for those that have offended us in one way or another, call them brother and put your hands of fellowship on them. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to you in the way as you came, has sent me that you might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. (laughs) Amazing that God would use a man like that and yet a man that was going to become great in his kingdom the Lord, even Jesus, because who did Jesus say he was to Saul when, he, when, when Saul asked him, who are you? I'm Jesus. He's confirming everything that has happened to him along the way so that he can believe, so that he can trust even more. Because the Lord showed him in a vision that Ananias was coming and that he was going to lay his hands on him. And everything that Jesus said, Ananias did so that Paul could be confirmed, so that he would realize, Jesus, you're real, that you're true. And what happens when you read something in Scripture and then somebody says something about it just just a little bit later? You realize, God, you were talking to me. You confirm those things. He confirms those to your heart, and it just encourages you in your walk with the Lord that he's real, that he's true, that this isn't something fake that we're just going through and making up in our own minds. This is a real faith. This is a living faith. And we've got a living Savior who's coming back for us soon. (laughs) Yahoo! Lord, come now before the storm stops. That way we won't have to drive home. Uh, The Lord, even Jesus, has appeared to you in the way as you came and has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately... There fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Uh, It's amazing. In in the book of Hosea, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, listen to what it says. It says, come. Uh, So Hosea is speaking to, to the remnant, speaking to the people. It says, come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Paul's been praying for three days. He said he's going to raise us up and live in his sight. As Hosea ministers to the remnant uh, in Israel, As he speaks unto them, he says, come, return to the Lord, because he's going to heal those things that were bad. He's going to bind up those things that were broken in us. He's going to revive us, and he's going to raise us up for life. And isn't that what he's doing with each and every one of us? As he's doing it with Saul, as he did it with Ananias, he does that with you and I. 
He takes those things that were broken and need binding up. He brings that to us. And He heals those hurts that were there. And every one of us has been hurt in the world. Whether hurt by family or hurt by the world or hurt by the enemy, we've been hurt. We've had hurts around us. We've had death. Those things hurt. We've had rejection. Those things hurt. He says, I'll bind those up so they won't be a hindrance to your walk with me anymore. And what does he do after that? Those things that have been hurt and healed, he raises us up to walk. Not to sit still, but to walk in the truth of who he is and be image bearers to the rest of the world, no matter where it takes us. (laughs) So immediately there fell from Saul's eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight, and he arose and was baptized. Can you imagine what they had to do for Ananias' heart? This guy is real. <laughs> it's true. He's he's come to faith. The Lord assured him, and he went. And this has got to be blowing his mind. This man who was the worst of all the enemies we've ever had, who was called an evil man by everybody, all of a sudden got changed. What do you think the people that saw you get saved said about you? That'll pass. It's just another fad. He probably too, took too much LSD and, and went off on another trip and he's doing this religious thing. He'll, he'll go back to what he used to be and yet we're still here walking because somebody bound us up, because somebody brought healing to us and somebody raised us up and his name is Jesus and we're walking with him. We bear his image. We're carrying his name in our hearts and our lives. We're his image bearers just as Paul is. And it said that when he had received meat, so remember, he hasn't had anything for three days. It says that he was strengthened. And then Saul was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. (laughs) It's amazing. We're going to see later on. We don't have time tonight, but we're going to see later on that he's going to go back. And and the disciples are going to be afraid to meet with him. But I think because Ananias probably was with him, that the other disciples felt comfortable enough. They saw him get baptized. They saw what had gone on in his life and Ananias uh, recounting this to them, that they were comfortable enough to sit with Saul, this murderer. But the thing is, you and I were murderers because Jesus said, if you've done it in your heart, you've already done it. If you've thought it, it's already been there. We're murderers. Oh, amazing that people would sit with us. Amazing that Jesus would love us. We have a wonderful Savior who's given us so much, who's blessed us beyond measure, just as he's done with Saul. And it should cause a change in our lives. And the longer we walk with him, the more it should be changing us. huh? The more it should be moving us to a place where we would just want to walk with him all of our days. And not... Put aside his name. So if you've been discouraged by the way the world is, be encouraged that if the Lord would do this with Saul, what does he want to do with you and I? The same things. He wants us to bear his image to the world. Do you realize what a privilege that is to bear the image of the living God in who you are? You get to carry his name, carry his presence. Remember in the Old Testament when they took the ark? And they carried it on their shoulders. The Levites, it could only be the Levites. You know what they were doing? They were carrying the presence of the Lord wherever they went. And it was only a select few that could carry it. But because the curtain has been torn, you and I can enter in boldly. We're now a kingdom of kings and priests. And we get to carry his presence. What a privilege that is to be image bearers of the living God in this world. Ah. It's almost overwhelming. I just kind of sh- want to shrink back. I, I, you, you almost hope there's a button over here, you know, where I could just get dropped down to the bottom here in that scene. Because, boy, it's, it's almost overwhelming. But it's his strength that is going to allow us to carry his image into this world. So let's do it the best that we can and purpose in our hearts that we want that. So, Father, we, we just come. We, we see this man, Saul, and, and we've read these things 
for years, Lord, in, in seeing these things and in just have understanding of these things. Uh, but, Lord, it, it still comes to a place every time that we see it that we realize more and more what an awesome gift you've given us of life. What an awesome privilege we have to bear your name, to be an image bearer of who you are to a lost and dying world. And Father, we want to be faithful. And so, Lord, if there's anything hindering us from being faithful, if we have issues in the heart that have just caused us to to push you aside, uh, you look at us tonight and you say, isn't it hard to kick against the goads? And Lord, it is. So help us to repent, Lord. Help us to turn from those things so that we might be good image bearers of who you are, Lord. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. Be with us, Lord, as we go from here. Give us traveling mercies and just set us free from ourselves that we could carry you well, Lord. They bore you, that ark, on their shoulders, the place of strength. And, Lord, we want to bear you in our strength. And you tell us that even if we're weak, you'll be our strength. So, Lord, help us to bear you well as we go through this world in these times. We just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.